Good afternoon and welcome to today's panel discussion, The Future of Gun Regulation Following Heller and McDonald. My name is Tom Sharp, and I'm the Associate Director of Programs for the American Constitution Society for Law and Policy. For those of you who aren't familiar with ACS, it's a national network of lawyers, law students, scholars, policymakers, and judges that promotes the, vi the vitality of the U.S. Constitution and the fundamental values it expresses, individual rights and liberties, genuine equality, access to justice, democracy, and the rule of law. We're delighted to have this panel of experts with us today to discuss the important and unresolved issues that courts will have to confront in the wake of the two recent Supreme Court, of two recent Supreme Court decisions regarding the Second Amendment, District of Columbia versus Heller and McDonald versus the City of Chicago. In Heller, the Supreme Court <clears throat> recognized an individual right to keep a handgun at home for self-defense. And in McDonald, the court held that this individual right applies to state and local governments other than the District of Columbia. The court has provided little guidance, however, on the constitutional standard that will be used to evaluate gun laws going forward. There are thousands of gun laws on the books at the local, state, and federal level, and they are now subject to challenge under the court's holdings, and there's considerable uncertainty as to what will happen with these laws and, and any others that legislators may want to enact. So we're especially lucky to have this panel of experts who have extensive knowledge on the issues and can set, shed some light on uh, what the Supreme Court decisions mean and how the lower courts handling the challenge will be handling these challenges into the future. Uh, before turning things over to the panel, I wanted to mention that ACS yesterday published a new issue brief by Tina Mayer and Adam Winkler, one of our distinguished panelists. Um, the issue brief, which is called the Standardless Second Amendment, captures the current state of the law and how courts have been dealing with Heller and McDonald up until now. Uh, the paper will make a great reading companion as you uh, digest the keen uh, observations and analysis you're about to hear, and you can pick up a copy at the registration table. Everyone should have received a copy of the biography sheet that um, uh, when you came in today that details the impressive accomplishments of our panelists and our moderator, Jamal Green, an associate professor of law at Columbia. Uh, Jamal will briefly introduce the other panelists, but it's my pleasure to introduce him. Jamal received his undergraduate degree from Harvard College and his law degree from Yale. Following law school, he served as a law clerk to Judge Guido Calabresi on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit and to Supreme Court Justice John Paul Stevens. After his clerkships, Jamal was named an Alexander Fellow at New York University School of Law and then joined the Columbia Law Faculty in 2008. Beyond his extensive knowledge of the law, he brings to the discussion the skill of a journalist that he honed as a reporter for Sports Illustrated for three years. I'm very pleased that he agreed to moderate today's panel, and I'd now like to turn it over to him. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Tom. Uh, can everyone hear me? Uh, good. Uh, welcome to uh, this discussion, uh, which should be very exciting, on the future of uh, gun regulation uh, after uh, Heller and McDonald. Uh, I'm just going to say a few words about logistics uh, and then uh, introduce our panelists. Uh, well, first, uh, as I said, I'll uh, introduce our speakers uh, very briefly. As Tom said, you have a, a bio in front of you, uh, or uh, you can pick one up uh, if you don't. Uh, and after those very brief introductions, I'll say just a, a few very brief words about uh, why we're here, uh, the, about the Heller and McDonald cases, uh, for what I suspect are the very few of you who uh, who would need an introduction to, to, uh, to the cases. Uh, then I'll turn it over to the panelists. Uh, after that, we'll uh, engage in uh, some follow-up discussion, uh, and then we'll open it up to questions, or as many questions as uh, time allows. Uh, so let me just uh, introduce our panelists very briefly. Uh, to my far right uh, is Adam Winkler. He's a professor of law at uh, UCLA, UCLA School of Law. Uh, Adam specializes in uh, constitutional law, and in particular, and as relevant, uh, here specializes in uh, Second Amendment issues and issues of constitutional standards of review. Uh, to my direct right, uh, uh, and, and Adam will talk to us a bit about uh, the standard of review uh, going forward, what it, what it might be, what the possibilities are, uh, and what that might uh, uh, implicate for uh, various uh, gun regulations. Uh, to my immediate right is Michael O'Shea. Uh, Michael is a professor of law at Oklahoma City University School of Law. Uh, he's also an expert in constitutional law with a special specialization in uh, state constitutional law in particular. Uh, and, and Michael will talk to us, uh, will continue the discussion of uh, the future of uh, particular kinds of regulations with a specific focus on uh, carry rights 
uh, and on particular kinds of uh, regulation of particular kinds of of firearms. Uh, To my uh, immediate left, uh, someone who will be familiar to many of you in the audience, uh, uh, Council Member uh, Mary Che. Uh, She is a member of the D.C. City Council, representing Ward 3. She's also a professor uh, of law at George Washington University uh, School of Law. Uh, And she's going to uh, talk to us a a bit about the legislative uh, response to Heller and uh, sort of how uh, legislators approach uh, the uh, issues raised by these two cases. And to my far uh, left is uh, Jan Vernick, uh, who is an uh, associate professor at the Bloomberg School of Public Health uh, at Johns Hopkins. Uh, he is also the co-director of the John, Johns Hopkins uh, Center for Gun Policy and Research. Uh, uh, Jan will discuss the role we can expect the research community to play uh, in legislation and in litigation uh, going forward. So uh, before we turn to uh, the panelists, Uh, As I mentioned, I'd say just a few words about uh, how we got here. Uh, Until uh, quite recently, uh, indeed for most of the 20th century, uh, most uh, serious people uh, in uh, constitutional law and scholarship uh, didn't think the Second Amendment was particularly relevant to modern constitutional law. The the amendment reads, uh, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, uh, the right of the people to keep and bear arms, uh, shall not be infringed. Uh, those words were understood uh, throughout much of the 20th century until quite recently uh, as uh, applying a right to uh, keep and bear arms in connection with uh, uh, the duties of a state militia. Uh, it was not understood to be an individual right uh, or something that uh, is justiciable as an individual right. That all began to change, uh, I think, largely in the 1980s and ni- 1990s, uh, motivated by a number of uh, of factors, uh, among them uh, obviously uh, interest group politics, uh, but also I think uh, some uh, renewed interest among constitutional scholars in constitutional history. And over time, uh, some of the views developed uh, uh, during that time uh, infiltrated into the federal courts. And so very early in this this now expiring decade, uh, we saw federal court opinions in uh, a district court in Texas uh, and in the Fifth Circuit, and then eventually in the D.C. Circuit, uh, deci- deciding that, in fact, the Second Amendment uh, should, does protect an individual right to keep and bear arms. And that D.C. case uh, was appealed to the Supreme Court and became uh, what we now know of uh, as District of Columbia versus Heller. That uh, case struck down uh, the district's uh, ban on handguns. Uh, it also struck down the uh, requirement that uh, other ki- types of firearms be protected by trigger lock uh, or kept unloaded uh, and dismantled. Uh, Heller, uh, as uh, Tom said, did not announce a standard of review. Uh, and as Adam will uh, talk to us a bit more about, uh, it said that the, D- the D.C. law was uh, unconstitutional, but didn't tell us very much about uh, what, to, what to do about other laws that implicate Second Amendment rights. Uh, District of Columbia versus Heller is also a case about the federal government, not a case about the state and local governments. Uh, obviously, D.C. is a federal territory, uh, and the, the question of whether uh, the right is incorporated and to what extent the right might be incorporated uh, against state and local governments was not uh, decided in that case, although the court sent plenty of signals that uh, soon thereafter it would decide, as it did in uh, McDonald versus City of Chicago, that in fact the Second Amendment uh, as an individual right provision does bind state and local governments as much as it does the federal government. Uh, it, again, the court did not tell us very much about the standard of review. In fact, it told us uh, literally nothing about the standard of review in McDonald. Uh, McDonald is a case that, uh, as I, I mentioned, a lot of people thought was pretty inevitable uh, after Heller, uh, but in many ways it's the more important of the two decisions, uh, if for no other reason than that the vast majority of gun control regulations are uh, state and local variety, not the federal government. Uh, and so maybe that's a, that, that can lead us into, uh, uh, into uh, Adam, uh, who will discuss uh, standards of review uh, going forward. Well, uh, thank you, Jamal, and uh, thank you to the American Constitution Society for having me, and thanks to all of you for uh, coming out today. So after the Supreme Court decided the Heller case in June of 2008, um, many people wondered if that case signaled the end 
uh, of, of all or most forms uh, of gun control in the same way that, say, Brown versus Board of Education signaled the, the effective end to all governmental forms of racial discrimination. At least that was the fear of many in the gun control community and uh, indeed the hope of many in the gun rights community that Heller would uh, have that far-reaching effect. It's two years later now, two and a half years later now, and uh, those fears and those aspirations have, uh, have not come to fruition. Since Heller, there have been about 200 federal court decisions on the constitutionality of various gun control laws. Uh, it seems that every person charged with uh, a gun crime uh, read Heller and now the McDonald case uh, to be a get-out-of-jail-free card uh, that they could play in their courts and uh, hope to uh, be freed up and, uh, and not be prosecuted. Um, and as a result, the federal courts have been uh, inundated with Second Amendment challenges uh, to uh, any number of different kinds of gun control laws. So uh, there have been challenges, for instance, to uh, all the major categories of different kinds of gun laws. Uh, first, uh, laws that restrict who's entitled to possess a firearm, uh, challenges to laws banning felons possessing firearms, anyone convicted of a felony, uh, anyone uh, who is a substance abuser, uh, uh, or a domestic batterer, for instance. Uh, there have been challenges to uh, laws restricting where guns can be possessed, the second big category. Uh, so courts have had to confront bans on possession of guns in school zones, uh, guns in national parks, um, uh, guns in uh, post office parking lots, and in airports. Uh, the courts have also had to face uh, challenges to the third big category, laws restricting the types of guns that people could own, and they've had to address laws restricting ownership of machine guns, sawed-off shotguns, assault weapons, uh, etc. And then there's been the last category, uh, challenges to licensing laws, laws that uh, permit some kind of uh, uh, special uh, rights with a gun uh, that but require a permit. So, for instance, there have been cases on uh, uh, dealing with constitutionality of licensing requirements for a permit to carry a concealed firearm, uh, which most states at least require some kind of permitting for concealed carry of firearm. The interesting thing is about with all these challenges in 200 cases is that other than the two handgun bans struck down in Washington, D.C. in the Heller case and in Chicago in the McDonald case, um, no law has been struck down on the basis of the Second Amendment since. There have been some settlements out of court that uh, has led, have led to some uh, municipalities to drop some gun control laws that they thought would be difficult to challenge. But so far, uh, applying the Heller and McDonald rule to gun control laws has not led to broad invalidation of these uh, gun laws. Now, I think this pattern should not come as a surprise. Uh, back in 2007, before the Heller case was decided, I wrote an article predicting that if the Supreme Court uh, read the Second Amendment to protect an individual right to bear arms, uh, it would not lead to the um, invalidation of most forms uh, of gun control. Now, this was not because I was a seer, if only, uh, but because I was a reader, and I had gone and read uh, hundreds of state constitutional law decisions dealing with the right to keep and bear arms. In fact, uh, in state constitutional law, there are few rights that are as firmly and widely recognized as the right of an individual to possess a firearm for self-defense. Um, in fact, 42 of the 50 states in their state constitutions protect this right. Some of those provisions go back all the way to the founding. Uh, most of them were adopted in the 1800s. Uh, and because of those state constitutional provisions, there have been hundreds of cases challenging the constitutionality of gun control under state constitutional law. Despite considerable variation in the demographics of these states, their political leanings, uh, one of the consistent themes we see in these constitutional state constitutional law cases is that the courts uphold gun control uh, and that they find uh, uh, nearly all forms of gun control to be constitutionally permissible. Since World War II, in fact, only a small handful of laws have been declared unconstitutional on state constitutional under state these state constitutional provisions, and I think in part because judges have a certain commitment to law and order, and the vast majority of challenges to gun laws are brought by criminals, uh, gangbangers, or hoodlums who are otherwise uh, caught up in uh, uh, law enforcement uh, and uh, thus challenge these gun laws, thinking that they are going to get out of jail. 
Heller itself also predicted uh, or also recognized the limitations of the majority's own decision. Uh, arguably, the most significant parts of the opinion weren't the sections in which the court goes on for page after page detailing the historical meaning of the Second Amendment. Rather, the most important part of the decision uh, was uh, almost certainly the section in the opinion where the court went out of its way to suggest that many forms of gun, gun control remain constitutionally permissible. Nothing in our opinion, the court said, should be taken to cast out on long, long-standing bans on possession of firearms by felons or the mentally ill, uh, to cast doubt on laws prohibiting gun, uh, gun possession in quote-unquote sensitive places like government buildings and schools or uh, other kinds of restrictions on the commercial sale of firearms like perhaps uh, background checks. Federal courts since the Heller case have consistently pointed to that paragraph in the Heller case to say um, the court is suggesting to us that gun control is not uh, unconstitutional. Uh, or that many forms of gun control, at least, aren't uh, uh, unconstitutional. After Heller was decided, one of the lawyers who was involved in the case came out and said that he regretted that paragraph in the Heller decision because he said, I think it creates more confusion than light. But if you're a diehard opponent of gun control, the problem with that section of the opinion is, is that it creates too much light. It sheds too much light on what the Supreme Court believes is constitutional or not, and it reveals that most forms of gun control uh, do not violate the Second Amendment right found uh, and articulated in uh, the Heller case. In many ways, uh, Heller's bark was worse than its right. So, in fact, uh, Heller so far looks, uh, looks, from my vantage point, to just be an affirmation of the long-standing tradition of gun rights in America. Next year, I have a book coming out uh, from W.W. W. Norton called Gunfight, The Battle Over the Right to Bear Arms in America. Uh, and it argues that we've always had the right to bear arms in this country. The framers of the Constitution had a profound fear of government taking away uh, civilian guns. Uh, and they thought that uh, uh, the Second Amendment, uh, whether it was designed for uh, primarily for the militia or not, was designed to preserve civilian ownership of firearms. This principle is reflected not only in the Second Amendment, I think, but in the state constitutional law provisions that I mentioned earlier that are the basis for so many constitutional challenges to gun control laws. At the same time, I argue in this book that we've always had gun control. The Founding Fathers had gun control, uh, including bans on the possession of firearms by people deemed to be untrustworthy and uh, an early form of gun registration, for example. Even the famed gun havens of the Wild West, the places like Dodge City and Tombstone, Arizona, uh, turned out to have the strictest gun control laws in the nation. Laws of a sort that the NRA today would never accept them. So gun control and gun rights are not mutually exclusive. And the gun debate, however, will probably never progress beyond its current binary all or nothing uh, uh, in, uh, approach to firearms until we recognize uh, that they're not mutually exclusive. And I think that by taking civilian disarmament off the table, which Heller does, while at the same time recognizing the constitutionality of many forms of gun control, uh, I th it's my hope that Heller and McDonald will help us get used to that fact and uh, perhaps enter into a new stage in the gun debate where we can recognize that there is a basic right to bear arms, but that many forms of gun control will still be constitutionally permissible. Thanks. Thank you, Adam. Uh, Michael? <clears throat> Thank you, Jamal, and I'd like to thank the ACS for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here and talk with you all. Um, I want to frame my discussion of some of the uh, most significant upcoming issues that are going to be decided uh, by the lower courts and ultimately by the Supreme Court, I think, concerning the scope of the Second Amendment right to keep and bear arms by offering one suggestion for why I think the Second Amendment, at least currently, is the most interesting provision in the Constitution. Uh, there are obvious reasons inherent to the nature of the right. Uh, it is serious business uh, because it implicates both long-standing traditional American notions of liberty and autonomy and because it implicates uh, the seriousness of gun violence. But in addition, it is interesting and important as a test case, kind of an ideal test case of a proposition about how American constitutionalism and constitutional politics work. 
Heller, it seems to me, is a test case for whether an essentially popular impetus, whether a, a claim to the recognition of a constitutional right that rests on an essentially popular uh, impetus, indeed a populist uh, source of motivation, can ever secure judicial recognition of a liberty. Uh, unlike a lot of other rights in the Constitution, it is not a strong concern of any segment of the legal elite. Uh, scholars such as Jack Balkan have written extensively about the importance of popular support in obtaining recognition of a constitutional right. But if you look at things like the First Amendment freedom of speech, well, the you know, direct personal interest of lawyers in that is pretty easy to ascertain. Uh, other constitutional rights that have been used to make important changes in American life, such as the First Amendment's Establishment Clause guarantee and uh, abortion rights, have also had strong support from aspects of the legal elite. You really can't say that about the Second Amendment. It has traditionally been better respected by elected branches than judges, by state courts than federal courts, by line police officers rather than high-ranking metro police chiefs, by small businesses better than chambers of commerce, and by western, southern, and midwestern states rather than by the handful of coastal jurisdictions in which every sitting justice of the Supreme Court was exclusively educated. But it's an ideal test case because everything else about the Second Amendment right is extremely strong as a claim for recognition. It is an explicit provision of the Constitution, the right of the people to keep and bear arms, much less of a contestable implication from the text than the abortion right. Uh, its popularity is extremely high. The federal courts, if they chose to enforce the right strongly, have tons of cover from the other political branches, from the political branches of the federal government. Uh, Congress has passed, you know, from national parks carry reform to the uh, protection of Lawful Commerce in Arms Act of 2005, which gave certain protections uh, against civil liability to gun manufacturers whose products work as intended, which was Congress explicitly invoking the Second Amendment and its 14th Amendment Enforcement Authority in passing that law, essentially conferring by statute a protection to against civil liability to producers of Second Amendment materials analogous to the one that the Supreme Court in New York Times v. Sullivan extended to producers of First Amendment materials. So ideal test case except for the fact that it is an, the, the, the weight placed on the right, the, the importance of it, the, the impetus for its recognition is essentially popular. Can it achieve recognition? The answer, yeah, by one vote so far. So it will be interesting to see. We, we've, I'm not going to talk too much about uh, most of the cases that Professor Winkler mentioned. What, what much of the lower court federal litigation has been so far has been filling out provisions of the Gun Control Act of 1968 and confirming, yep, that's constitutional, yep, that's constitutional. And indeed, the, the, the paragraph in Heller of which so much was made uh, recognizing certain kinds of presumptively constitutional limitations on the Second Amendment right essentially s sketches out the structure of the Gun Control Act of 68, the major federal gun control statute. Another part of Heller essentially pointed right at the National Firearms Act of 34, which governs exotic, unusual firearms like machine guns and things like that, and said it was constitutional. I think the most interesting and telling set of cases to look at right now are the cases having to do with the right to carry arms. Does the right to bear arms include a right to carry them outside the home for the purpose of self-defense, especially handguns? Um, and there's a litigation, as you may know, that is pending right now uh, in the U.S. District Court of uh, the U.S. District Court for the District of Columbia, Palmer versus District of Columbia. In the aftermath of McDonald and Heller, uh, the District of Columbia adopted new firearms laws, and one of them completely revoked the authority to grant carry permits to private individuals. Um, Palmer seeks to get essentially, if what McDonald and Heller did was to move a handful of, of extreme outlier jurisdictions, DC and Chicago, into the mainstream. Uh, what Palmer and other carry cases are about is will the somewhat larger group of jurisdictions 
that have not joined the, the consensus of a majority of American jurisdictions on shall issue carry permits, uh, does the Second Amendment compel them to join it? And the plaintiffs in Palmer seek a license to carry on the same terms as the District of Columbia's pistol possession license, which includes a background check, safety training, and so on. It's essentially uh, a standard shall issue carry permit system of the sort that's in effect today in about 40 American states representing uh, a clear majority of the population as well. And the case is strong. The, if, if, if you look at the conventional legal materials, um, much of early right to arms litigation was about guns carrying. For, for the first hundred odd years of American law, that's what the Second Amendment cases and right to arms cases were about. And there are numerous court decisions uh, either directly striking down complete bans on the carry of handguns or upholding concealed carry regulations on the explicit premise that the right to openly carry in a, in a visible belt holster um, was protected and was not prohibited. And at that time, unlike today, that was considered the more socially acceptable uh, way of wearing a, a firearm for defense. The description of what the right to bear arms means in Heller points directly at it. As the court concluded, at the time of the founding as now, to bear meant to carry. And the court continues that in the context of bearing arms, uh, it, it means to wear, bear, or carry upon the person or in the clothing or in a pocket for the purpose of being armed and ready for offensive or defensive action in a case of conflict with another person. Not surprisingly, uh, one of the cases, Peruta versus County of San Diego, which is being brought in the Southern District of California, uh, has survived a motion to dismiss, claiming that this language constitutionally requires a shall issue permit. Now, here's the, the last point I'll make is that I would put the odds at about two out of three that sometime in the next five years, uh, a claim like the plaintiffs in Palmer will prevail with the Supreme Court, assuming that there aren't some critical changes in the court's membership. Um, all bets are off at that point. Um, if that happens, it's worth noting, uh, what's being asked for is a right that's subject to quite a bit of regulation. Uh, the plaintiffs are fine with the idea of neutrally applied, reasonable background checks, the requirement of a permit in order to carry, and they say the district or any other American jurisdiction can regulate the right to carry in the traditional manner by it can prescribe open carry and require concealed carry only, or if it wishes, it can ban concealed carry but on the theory of the 19th century cases so emphasized by the Supreme Court throughout McDonald and Heller, which means if you ban the one, you have to allow the other. I'll leave it at that. Okay. Thank you. Turn to Council Member Chang. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you very much, and uh, thank you for the invitation to participate in this. Uh, as you know, we started all the trouble um, <laughs> that led to this, so we have uh, something – uh, to say about it. Uh, when the uh, decision was handed down, of course, uh, the immediate need was to figure out what it meant and what it meant for us to do for the uh, local law. And we had to do something because the law was uh, struck down. The, um, uh, the, di the difficulty of the task uh, was compounded by the um, lack of clarity in the opinion itself. We had a number of things that we had to figure out. First of all, we had to figure out uh, what the um, actual uh, right was. And you've heard something already about what, what the right might include. But um, in terms of being as precise as possible, uh, I, I think that it's somewhat justifiable, perhaps not a winning argument, but somewhat justifiable to say that the right that was essentially protected in Heller was the right to have a handgun in the home and to have access to it immediately uh, for self-defense. Now, by doing that, we get into this issue about carrying it elsewhere. And the opinion does point in two different directions. It does talk about having a handgun to meet confrontations. And confrontations can occur other than in the home, of course. It also says that uh, it would be okay to limit handguns in certain places, thereby implying that you can have them in other than those places, and it included things more than the home. Um, but 
the essential right, as it kept being framed throughout the opinion, seemed to focus on self-defense in the home. So that was our cue for how we were going to think about that. Um, there was also the question about what guns. Now, uh, there was initially an attempt to think about this in a most restrictive way, but uh, I think on balance, since the court was talking about, you know, having uh, handguns, the quintessential self-defense weapon, that semi-automatic handguns ought to be a uh, part of that as well. But we drew a line. We drew a line. We said, yes, semi-automatic, semi but not uh, fully automatic or not uh, ones that carry uh, clips that would allow them to, in effect, function as a... Uh, a machine gun, if you will. Uh, so we had to think that through. Uh, we al also had to think through who uh, could possess a gun. And of course, the opinion itself referred to some categories of folks that uh, uh, couldn't possess a gun. And then uh, we had some other issues. Basically, what we wanted to do was identify as best we could what the uh, new right was all about and identify as best we could by not being uh, too expansive about it because there's a great you know, concern in the District of Columbia over, over guns, as you might imagine. So um, having done that, then the attempt was to figure out, well, how can we have regulation that responds to the concerns that we have? And we had a whole variety of concerns. They're fairly conventional, but you know, they're uh, perhaps exacerbated here in the District of Columbia. We are an urban jurisdiction. We are the capital. We have uh, all sorts of demonstrations and confrontations here all the time. It's, it's an unusual, um, perhaps unique place, and I'm going to make, make a point of that too. Um, and then we're worried about the conventional kinds of things, as I mentioned. We're worried about uh, too easy access to guns uh, by children or by others, uh, so accidents. We're worried about uh, people who act uh, spontaneously and, and may uh, commit suicide. We're worried about heightening the uh, possibility that people who are <clears throat> dangerous or have domestic violence issues might use guns, things, things of that nature. So identifying what we thought were the kinds of things we wanted to address, then we started thinking about what those regulations should look like. Now, in terms of what those regulations should look like, um, we had a couple of guides in mind. One of them is to, uh, to be somewhat particular and not to sort of lard up the law with all sorts of regulations that in effect would prevent uh, people from uh, having a gun. And then to make sure whatever it is we were going to put in place that we had sufficient justification via uh, written testimony or oral testimony or expertise because we knew that even though Heller didn't tell us what the standard was, it did say it wasn't going to be rational basis review, so it had to be something with a little bit more uh, substance than that. Uh, we were hoping it wouldn't be uh, strict scrutiny, but obviously it had to have some um, substance to it and some justification. So we wanted to make sure whatever we did that at the hearings and whatever other methodology of acquiring information, we could make the connection between what we were doing and the uh, harms that we thought would ensue. And so at the end of the day, what we did is adopt a, a series of regulations that probably are the strictest in the nation and um, might set us on this path of figuring out what's permissible and not permissible. We have, uh, for example, uh, the, you know, you must register. Uh, you can't, we're not, we don't permit you to take guns uh, outside of the home except for narrow purposes if you have to carry them somewhere or something like that. But, but essentially we're talking about a right that's uh, to have a gun available in your home. Um, there are a whole variety of things that will prevent you from having a gun. The, these include, you know, uh, conviction of a crime, the conventional kinds of things like that. But um, it includes also some other things. It would be interesting to see how this is applied. Uh, within five years of seeking a gun, that you not uh, have a history of violent behavior, <laughs> whatever that – I would include my husband. No, no. Um, I'm kidding, dear. Uh, but other things, for example, uh, you can't be a respondent in an intra-family proceeding in which a civil protection order was issued against the applicant. Um, you can be certified as having been recovered, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, you have to have firearms training. You know, you have to 
some have training and learn how to drive a car. We figured you ought to have to have training and learn how to, to use a gun and other things uh, of that nature. Now, I think that we were uh, aided with this strategy because in one of the challenges uh, that will be uh, heard, and it, it will be heard by the uh, D.C. Uh, Circuit Court on November 15th, so if you're, if you're around, um, the judge below upheld our regulations but did so largely in the course of the opinion by talking about what the regulations were that were challenged and whether there was evidence sufficient. This, uh, the lower court judge used a, an intermediate scrutiny and satisfied himself that the record was thick enough, full enough, specific enough to satisfy an intermediate scrutiny. So I think that what we have is extensive. I think it is justifiable because we are the nation's capital. I think we are a special jurisdiction, and that I would make that point in terms of carry laws. Um, and I think that we've done the best we can in terms of a legal challenge to insulate ourselves. Whether we prevail, obviously, is going to be another question. Thank you. Professor Brunick. Okay. Well, let me add my thanks to, uh, to ACS for inviting me and for putting on this, um, this session. Can you hear me at this, at this volume? Okay. I'd, I'd like to start I, at a place that's probably not necessary for, for this group, but I, I sort of feel compelled to do it, and that is to remind us all that what we're talking about today is, is not simply an abstract legal issue. To, to remind us that in 2007 there were 30,000, more than 30,000 people shot and killed by a firearm in the United States, another more than 70,000 people um, shot and seriously wounded, so that's more than 100,000 folks in just one year. You can do the math as easily as I can over a 10-year period. That means a million people killed or seriously wounded by, um, by gunfire. The lifetime, the total lifetime cost of uh, this firearm-related death and injury has been estimated to exceed $100 billion, so we're talking about an enormous burden on our society, um, not just in deaths and injuries, but in cost. And it's a burden that is disproportionately felt by certain segments of the population. So, f for example, for uh, young African-American males, death by firearm is the leading cause of death, the number one cause of death in the country. So, again, pardon me for reminding us of um, all of that, but to put these, these legal issues into to some context. So I've been asked to talk a little bit about what the role of the research community might be going forward post Heller and McDonald. And the role of the research community in general, of course, is to do unbiased research, to, to do unbiased research into both risk and protective <coughs> factors for firearm death, injury, et cetera, and also to try to do research to figure out what works and what doesn't work to address those risk factors and ultimately, therefore, hopefully to, to prevent or reduce firearm-related deaths and injuries. So what, what kind of research are, are we talking about here? I think that I would argue that under almost any standard of review that the courts are likely to adopt, and I think my, my panelists, co-panelists have, have agreed with me largely, under almost any standard of review, empirical evidence is going to turn out to be relevant um, for judges considering the constitutionality of, of these laws. That empirical evidence, as I've already alluded to, can be evaluations of the effects of a specific law on a specific outcome, a specific outcome, whether that's a public health outcome like, um, like death or injury, whether that's an outcome we might think of as more in the, the vein of criminology like robbery or, um, or assault, whether that outcome affects reductions in costs associated with, um, with gun-related violence or other kinds of outcomes uh, that might be seen as more intermediate, like efforts to reduce illegal gun trafficking, something that has, um, has garnered a fair bit of attention. So that's, that's the kind of research that, that, again, might very specifically try to evaluate the effects of a, of a given law. But I would argue, too, that 
the empirical research that address, addresses risks and protective factors, especially where those risk factors might be the kind of risk factors that laws are intended to address, turn out to be tremendously relevant as well. So uh, an example of a court using an intermediate scrutiny ap approach is the Seventh Circuit's en banc decision in the United States versus Scoyne, I think is the pronunciation. There the court relied very heavily on um, risk factor research demonstrating that, um, that if in the context of intimate partner violence, if you introduce a firearm into that context, that violence that may already exist is much more likely to be lethal violence. And that ultimately proved quite persuasive for the Seventh Circuit. But there are other kinds of risk factor research that, um, that one might consider, uh, risk factors with regard to whether guns have specific safety devices on them, for example, and how that affects risks of um, accidental deaths or suicides as just, um, just one other example. Now, how much research will be needed and how persuasive that research will have to be and how close the fit will have to be between the, the means and the ends, that will probably depend more on the specific standard that is used and maybe even the specific judge applying that standard. In addition to to doing research. I think that the research community has other roles that it um, can and probably will be called upon to play. Cases are going to need expert witnesses, um, people to, um, even before trial, help the, the litigators to basically understand the large volume of, of research, um, but maybe also to, to testify at trial. Now, problem there, of course, is that there there aren't actually that many folks who have devoted a substantial part of their career to to studying, from again a, a research perspective, to to studying firearms and violence. And, and part of that ha is because this has been a relatively poorly funded area, poorly funded, at least in in recent years, by both federal uh, government and private foundation and, and other sources. So, um, so those of us in the research community, frankly, are a tiny bit concerned that the demand for our services may ultimately exceed the supply. Um, we are also, we have been called upon and are likely to continue to be called upon to assist with amicus briefs, not, not to help craft the specific legal argument, but to, um, to help to sort of plug in how the, the research and the, the law <laughs> fit together. Uh, Councilwoman Che has already talked about how um, researchers can assist when new laws are being drafted, can assist with helping to make sure that those laws are supported by the best available research to help assist in developing a legislative record that ultimately becomes uh, useful for, for judges if and when those, um, those laws are challenged. And finally, what we like to do best, frankly, is to conduct new research. That's why most of us got into this, um, into this world. And, um, and sadly, again, in part because of the funding challenges, the, there isn't as much research out there as we would um, like there to be, despite the fact that um, there are many, many interesting questions that remain, despite the fact that natural experiments um, can be exploited because we have a federal system with 50 states, some states with laws, some states without, and laws that get enacted at, at different times. So, so that's, um, that's something that researchers can exploit to, to do that research. But again, we have to have the intellectual capital and the human capital, the number of people to do that research. We have to have the, the funding for it. It has to be um, supported and ultimately the time to, to do it. Thanks very much. Uh, thank you to uh, all of our panelists who are not only have uh, impressive substantive knowledge but uh, are able to stay on time, which is uh, a very important <laughs> skill. That, well, you uh, are a very strict taskmaster. <laughs> uh, let me uh, follow up uh, a bit. Uh, and, and there's a question for really for, for any, any of the panelists who wants to address it, but I'll, I'll direct it at, at Adam uh, since he – uh, talked about the fact that you know, most, the vast majority of regulations uh, have been upheld since Heller and were being upheld before Heller uh, under state constitutional law. <clears throat> First year of law school, you're sort of taught 
that there is a set of standards, a set of uh, for reviewing constitutional rights. You've got your strict scrutiny. Maybe it's, it's all have come up in the with the other uh, panelists. You have strict scrutiny, which you know necessary to a compelling governmental interest, and those are all going to get struck down basically. Uh, and you have a rational basis review, uh, so long as uh, the government can articulate some rational basis, uh, it can be hypothetical even, uh, the, the law is going to be upheld, and that's you know most sort of social and economic regulations uh, we're told. And there's something in the middle called intermediate scrutiny, uh, and that's uh, uh, that's uh, you know in, uh, substantially related to an important governmental interest. And the assumption is usually those things are, are not going to survive, but sometimes they might. This is an, in a way of uh, rights uh, not uh, being fatal in fact, uh, but nonetheless getting heightened scrutiny. That's sort of your black letter law as to tiers of review. But now we've got this right that uh, you tell us have, uh, is consistently upheld. Uh, we usually associate that with rational basis review, but we're, we've been told that rational basis review is not the appropriate standard. How do we, how should we think about putting this new right, uh, this new federal right, uh, into the language of constitutional law that we're all familiar with, or or is there is there not a paradigm that already exists? Well, it's interesting. There's certainly this paradigm that every first year law student learns uh, the strict scrutiny and any law that regulates a right that is subject to strict scrutiny, the law is invariably struck down and uh, rational basis review, as you say, uh, invariably leads to the law being upheld. Um, but that's not the only way we do constitutional jurisprudence in America. We also have what we call categorical rules. Um, there are some constitutional provisions that they don't use these kinds of tests or standards. Rather, they have various categorical rules. They say if something is in this category, it's upheld, and if it's outside of that category, it's not upheld. So, uh, for instance, there's no standard of review uh, on the question of uh, whether you've received uh, ineffective assistance of counsel under the Constitution. There are categorical rules for what counts as ineffective assistance of counsel, uh, and if the state denies you that assistance, then the law is invalid, regardless of what kind of standard of review applies. And it seems that uh, while there's a lot of confusion in the lower courts, while some courts have tried to fit this uh, Second Amendment into these traditional standards of review, uh, there seems to be emerging uh, more and more courts addressing the Second Amendment, uh, Second Amendment in categorical terms. And that's in part because of that paragraph that I mentioned in the Heller decision uh, that says we're not intending to call into question laws banning possession of firearms or laws banning guns in sensitive places or laws that involve com restriction of commercial sales of firearms. What's happening, courts are, courts are looking at that, that paragraph and saying, well, the court's basically giving us a series of categories. If you're a felon or can be likened to a felon, then we can take a gun away from you. And it doesn't matter whether the government has really good reasons for doing so or not. The only thing that really matters is whether you're in that category. And if you're a felon, uh, uh, someone who's been convicted of a felony, we're going to take the gun away from you. Uh, and the same thing with sensitive places. Courts aren't necessarily saying, uh, does the government have a really good reason to keep guns out of post office parking lots? Uh, this is when an employee generally has a firearm, wants to leave it in his car while he's at work, and then be able to have the, the firearm in his car. They're not saying we're going to say, well, does government uh, have a really good reason for this? They're saying, that's a sensitive place. That's the category. And if you have that gun in a sensitive place, we're taking it. Uh, we're going to say that uh, you are not protected in that right. So part of the question for the future of the Second Amendment jurisprudence, and if you get a chance to look at the issue brief that uh, Tina Mayer and I wrote and that's available for distribution here today, um, I call it, it's called the standardless, standardless Second Amendment. And what it says is that the Supreme Court really has failed to give the lower courts sufficient guidance about how to answer these questions. It's failed to say whether they should apply a standard of review, and if so, which standard of review. It has fa failed to say we should be using categorical rules and, lay out, and, and, and has failed to lay out clearly what those categories are. So the jurisprudence really is all over the map. The interesting and unifying feature of the jurisprudence, however, is that regardless of the approach the courts use, strict scrutiny, intermediate scrutiny, rational basis, or these categorical rules, the gun control laws have been upheld. That's the unifying theme. So it's odd that the Supreme Court has provided a certain amount of guidance, uh, but part of that guidance that they've suggested is that most forms of gun control law, gun control, are still constitutionally permissible. I don't want to be taken to say that no more gun laws are to are going to be struck down. 
Uh, and I certainly actually don't believe that uh, uh, there aren't gun control laws that should be struck down because I think there are gun laws that uh, go too far and uh, are not based in, uh, in good, reasoned uh, public policy. Uh, and I would not be surprised over the next few years if we see a ruling like Mike mentioned about uh, concealed carry of firearms or other kinds of laws. But I think that in general what we're going to see is that those laws that are struck down are going to be outlier laws. Uh, that are not going to be the sort of mainstream gun control laws that we uh, commonly find. You want to follow up on that? Yeah, uh, I'd like to make a couple of points about that. First of all, you see this in other areas of constitutional laws. You say you call them categorical rules, but what happens is you, you, you tend to get these categorical rules, and in the lower court opinion in the case challenging uh, the D.C. regulations, the, the judge differentiated between what's in the core, you know, of the Second Amendment and what's not in the core and applied a different approach. But even if you do it categorically or you do it in the core, there, there are going to be uh, borderline cases. If you say you can't have a gun in sensitive places, and what if my argument is, well, the District of Columbia is entirely a sensitive place, you know, we're going to have to, we're going to, have to consider that. So uh, we're not going to get out of this bind. We need greater clarity one way or the other, if it's categorical or uh, core, and then what's in, what's out, and then in any event what the test would be. One of the things that is worrisome, and it's worrisome across a spectrum of con law cases such as this, if we go with uh, these standards, you know, and if we stay within the standards, and I know justices like Justice Stevens were always complaining that, you know, we're stuck in these boxes and it shouldn't be like that. We should just have a spectrum. But if we do have these standards, because people want to have some predictability and judges want to be sort of tied to the mass so it doesn't look like they're making stuff up every time, um, Part of the problem is if we have a mid-level scrutiny, which is a fairly hefty scrutiny here, uh, you know, whether the law substantially furthers an important objective, you can get the important objectives pretty easily. It's whether you have this means and fit that's adequate enough. And I worry that, you know, uh, a kind of a loose means ends here will migrate to other areas. I mean, we've seen this, for example, with gender discrimination. In gender discrimination, we say we're applying a mid-level scrutiny, but mm, maybe something a bit more because we often think about uh, looking to alternatives. If there's an alternative way to achieve the government objective without using gender as a category, well, then you ought to do that. So if that sort of stricter test is applied here, is there some other way to achieve your objective and empirically you're going to prove all this to us, uh, to keep down the number of suicides, then if you follow that version, you'd have a, a stronger test. But if you have this sort of weaker uh, version, this um, thin beer approach to, to things, uh, you worry that it migrates to other areas. So uh, maybe we should just be straightforward and say for the Second Amendment, if there's an individual constitutional right, Maybe it is of such a character, given the history, that we should have a test developed for it. No. I, uh, <clears throat> I uh, propose to offer an explanation of what's going on with standard and review in these cases. Now, notice that I'm not saying that what the standard of review is, but here's why we can't figure out what it is. Um, Justice Scalia and probably some other justices on the court, I speculate, uh, would like to have a framework for e evaluating the constitutionality of gun regulation, something like this. And it's actually it's similar to some of the, the concepts that uh, Council Member Che mentioned. There are – courts try to identify certain – historical or traditional exceptions to the right, things that just weren't considered part of the right. Um, a lot of the, the rhetoric and apparatus in Heller in particular makes it seem like this is an inquiry into original public meaning at the time of ratification. I'm not sure it actually washes because while there's a lot of history in the opinions, uh, Heller would be on much firmer ground if it claimed more. We're trying to identify traditional exceptions to the right that have grown up over time and become widespread. Uh, if a regulation falls within one of those traditional exceptions, it's, it's pretty much going to be valid. If, if not, then 
we would ask, does the regulation substantially burden or seriously burden the ability to use uh, one's arms for self-defense, like a handgun ban? And if so, it is invalid, period, unless perhaps there was some truly exceptional danger prevention uh, or, or safety interest. And I think a lot of Heller can be read as consistent with this. Um, the, the belief that this is what we're driving toward explains the passage in Heller uh, that criticizes Justice Breyer's arguments for an interesting balancing approach. If, because the thing about this approach is it asks maybe about the magnitude of the burden on the exercise of the right, but not really as much about the countervailing safety concerns. And then you can make sense of Justice Scalia's majority opinion saying things like, you know, the, the rejecting the idea of a freestanding interest balancing approach and saying that the very enumeration of the right takes out of the hands of government the power to decide on a case by case basis whether it is really worth insisting on. The problem was, for whatever reason, maybe just to secure the votes of justices that were needed to comprise a majority, uh, there had to be some language in the opinion that says some some very favorable things about the likely constitutionality of a bunch of different types of uh, gun regulations, not all of which are all that traditional. Uh, the prohibition on possession by felons wasn't a, a general federal rule, wasn't the, the law comprehensively at the federal level until 1968, uh, not, not too traditional. So there are the concessions and the things that had to be in the opinion to get it to be a majority, and there is an underlying uh, effort to lay a ground for a more categorical uh, Second Amendment jurisprudence, which would be the way I described. I think that approach has a great deal to be said for it, and I tentatively hope the court gets there. They will probably have to come up with some term other than undue burden or substantial burden because Justice Scalia won't sign off on it mm -hmm. if it contains that. <laughs> Uh, let me let me just ask you a, a bit of a follow up that maybe uh, about that list mm -hmm. that, that Justice Scalia uh, list or that may not be the Justice Scalia list might be the Justice Kennedy list that's hidden within the Justice Scalia list uh, uh, and maybe in the context of you know you you said that you think that uh, uh, some uh, a case related to carry rights will, will reach the Supreme Court soon uh, there's sort of the primary list and then there's which is the you know sensitive places. Uh, mental people with mental illness, history of mental illness, uh, people with criminal convictions, um, and commercial regulations. And then right before that passage, Justice Scalia says, and there have been long-standing prohibitions on concealed carry. Mm -hmm. Right. So, so there's already a question in the case, perhaps, of, of well, how much of the list is a holding of the court? And then there's this other category, which maybe you can only put concealed carry in that category, of, well, maybe that's kind of a holding, but maybe a little bit less of a holding. Uh, and I, I'm just curious how we think about the list in general, uh, how we think about uh, carry laws. Or, or, or has, has the court already said that these are presumptively, uh, or concealed carry uh, prohibitions are presumptively um, con uh, uh, constitutional, uh, or should we think of it in some different way? I can answer that. Does anybody else want to? OK. Um, it's a good question, because the, and, and it, here again, there's the categoricalism, uh, which has some strong attractions in this context, versus the what we might call reasonable regulation approach. Um, it's it's going to be a little bit of a puzzle for uh, categorically minded judges how exactly to conceive carry rights, because there's a real argument, uh, as as Professor Green points out, the court said bans on concealed carry are traditionally viewed as constitutional. That kind of suggests that if you use this framework, they're, they're not in the right. At the same time, the court says a lot of stuff that indicates that bare means carry, you know, on your, on your person or in a pocket for purposes of, conf of confrontation, which sounds a lot like a right to carry outside the home. 
And then we get up and we, we get into a situation where there's very, it would perhaps be the most originalist uh, position to take, that there is a right to carry. It is limited to open carry. And, of course, the limitations on sensitive places would come with it. That's, that really is traditional. You can go back to the 19th century and see courts articulating that view. So it would fit within the framework pretty well. Um, and although the permit-based requirement is not as traditional. A lot of the 19th century cases and a lot of state constitutions today protect permitless open carry. Um, but I think any version of this that just prudentially that you can get five justices to sign off is probably going to have uh, shall issue permitting will be constitutional in the form that it exists. So this is a problem just in the sense that then it means there is this constitutional right to exercise it. Uh, individuals will have to use what is now today, at least in many contexts and probably in many, you know, in most urban areas, uh, the less socially acceptable, more unsettling, off-putting mode of carry. And to the extent that it's conceded that we're going to protect carry rights, I think most people would prefer to move carriers toward concealed carry, which you could do if you said the right is a right to carry, but it is subject to reasonable regulation, and one of the reasonable regulations is the mode. But then you're not doing categoricalism. I think, yeah, if I can just jump in here. Um, I think sort of the, the concern with concealed carry is a, is a valid one, uh, but it can be distracting in some ways. Uh, concealed carry is allowed in uh, 48 states, Right, or 49 states, um, almost every state allows concealed carry of firearms. Uh, the real question is not whether you have a right to carry a concealed weapon, but what kind of permitting requirements can the state or the city require you uh, to, uh, to satisfy before you can uh, carry a firearm? Most states have uh, pretty liberal laws in terms of allowing concealed carry of firearms. Obviously, some states and especially some cities uh, uh, have more restrictive laws, and that's where there will be some debate. Um, but whether there's a right to carry outside of the home, I think is probably uh, not nearly as important as it might seem because most states already allow you to carry a firearm outside of the home. And this is actually one of the the cruel ironies facing uh, the gun control proponents uh, in uh, today's world, which is because uh, the court hasn't, the courts haven't struck down too many gun control laws, uh, in part because gun control proponents have uh, had such a tough time getting laws passed over the last 20 years um, that the NRA and the gun lobby is very strong, and uh, there's a lot of voters who make this a single-issue vote uh, uh, when it comes to candidate elections, and as a result, there's not that many. Um, uh, crazy and irrational gun laws, uh, uh, certainly not as many as some people like to pretend there are. Um, so I, I think the part of the story here is that, um, uh, is that the, the battle for, about gun control is not going to happen, I think, ultimately in the courts, that it's a legislative battle, and it's going to happen in the elected branches fundamentally, uh, and, and that's where the real battles will happen. Let me, oh, go ahead. Well, I was simply going to say, uh, you know, in terms of... Um, thinking this through, the specter of if, if we have a categorical right uh, for uh, carrying guns other than in the home and out in public, and if it's an open carry right, the specter of um, that in Washington, D.C., on our streets is almost too much uh, to contemplate. Um, and the fact that most states might allow concealed carry, uh, I don't know how that should I don't know how that should play out, even concealed carry, uh, if we were to include that as well. Because, again, uh, is, is there anything to be said, well, even if most states would allow it, is that actually a constitutional right, you know? Um, because states can be more liberal in what they permit. It's whether they fall beneath the floor. And is that part of the, of the floor? I just... Um, I think we have to grapple with uh, some sort of standard and some sort of empirical data about what dangers we are then inviting uh, into the community. And in the District of Columbia, carrying concealed or certainly <coughs> carrying openly, uh, maybe I have a want of imagination, but I only see uh, terrible uh, danger and trouble in that. Uh, let me just say... Uh, uh, Adam's last point uh, about uh, about permitting, uh, which uh, you know you, you you mentioned that that's where the real battle is, and there are not a lot of states, but there are, as you mentioned, local jurisdictions that 
say things like you get a permit uh, if you uh, have good character, uh, and if that's decided by the, the relevant local bureaucrat. Well, uh, maybe that would take care of the problem in the district <laughs> because you have all these politicians here. Only, only, good, only good character in, in D.C. Uh, so I, 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 I sort of wonder, now I, I would imagine that someone who's, that uh, is someone ad advising jurisdictions what they should do about Heller or, or about McDonald would say, well, this might be a problem, right, uh, that, that there's just this arbitrary discretion for an official. And I, I wonder, uh, from a sort of legislative perspective, the extent to which there's sort of coordination uh, about sort of good practices, bad practices, is this really just an internal process uh, for, the, for a particular city council or a particular uh, legislature, or is there, is there uh, some kind of uh, uh, effort to uh, understand where the pitfalls might might lay, uh, or, or, what, or what sort of, you know, what is what's a what's a way of uh, of getting something getting something through that that uh, a way of framing a right or the, the right kind of empirical research you should be uh, bringing to bear. Well, you know, we can't do this obviously in a vacuum, much as we would like to, and we can't do just what we want, much as we would like to, because we know that we were operating in the shadow of uh, lawsuits, and. Uh, so again, the, it was quite specifically the case that when we went forward, we wanted to make sure that we had a foundation uh, for it. Could it have been better? Uh, yeah, probably it could have been better. We need you. Um, but we, we, could, we couldn't have done it uh, you know, without stepping outside because we knew we would be examined very closely. Um, and so that's, you know, that's what we did. And in fact, in that lower court opinion, there are references throughout. Uh, there was one argument about uh, the uh, limitation on the number of rounds you could have with a gun. I think it's under 12. I forget. But in any event, the argument was, well, you know, uh, that uh, empirically that will uh, affect uh, the ability of someone to engage in self-defense, you know, the two to three seconds that you may need to, to reload after you've put out your 10 uh, bullets or something like that. And the court at, at one point, uh, you know, finally said, although there was a differentiation, what's in the core, what's not, the court finally said, you know, um, you don't like the fact that you lost in the legislature because uh, you want it to come out a certain way, but we're, we're looking at what the legislature did and we're looking at the, the, the testimony and the evidence that they had before it, you know, the testimony from the chief of police and, and so on uh, about how dangerous uh, those kinds of guns can be for the police. Um, and so we were able to prevail, at least in the lower court op opinion, because there was a, a sufficiently thick record that gave us the foundation for that. Uh, speaking of records, uh, uh, let me before we turn to audience questions, let me just uh, ask a question of, of Jan. Uh, uh, you mentioned the sort of lack of funding for research of this sort, and uh, it's I think easy if you just read opinions uh, in this area to believe that there's sort of one side that's funding research saying that guns actually either don't cause violence at all or actually avert violence, uh, and then the other side has its own funded research saying the opposite of that, uh, and that, the, that you'll just have a perpetual impasse of research. And uh, I, I, I guess the question is uh, a question of what, what kind of balance is there, if any, between sort of interest group affiliated, interest group funded research and independent research. Uh, and is this just a sort of follow the money kind of situation, or is it uh, is there, is it, uh, uh, you know, are, how many people are really doing sort of independent, you know, nonpartisan research uh, that's not sort of being being funded by one of the, someone who wants a litigation exhibit? <laughs> well, I, broadly speaking, I think that the, um, the fact that on most topics with regard to gun violence prevention, there can be found research that says one thing and research that says another thing. Um, and that's, that's going to be a real challenge for, for judges to, to parse. People like me have been arguing for years that we need judges that are better educated in um, how to think through empirical research. In terms of following the, following the research funding, so I work at a Center for Gun Policy and Research that's part of the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. So we think of ourselves as academic researchers whose, whose job it is to 
um, to figure out what works and, and what doesn't work and publish the results. Chips fall where they may. But there will be folks, uh, certainly, who will perceive our research as, as biased because it's funded by um, a foundation that is known to, um, to fund other kinds of gun research or because it's funded by uh, parts of the federal government, for example. So um, I, I wish that there was an, an, an easy way to say research of this character will be seen as gold standard, pure, no, no one will be able to, to make an argument for, for bias. But um, unfortunately, I don't think it's going to be that, that easy for, um, for judges or for, for litigants. I, uh, in many ways, uh, entirely agree that it would be valuable and would probably uh, even increase the quality of decision making if uh, courts were willing to look at uh, external empirical sort of objective evidence in determining uh, the scope of Second Amendment rights. And there are a few that I can think of that I wish we saw more of because they actually seem the, – the, the real um, heart of the gun policy safety injury prevention literature is dealing with incredibly difficult and complex multi-causal scenarios. It's just, it's tough stuff. Uh, people like Professor Vernick, Gary Kleck, uh, lots of uh, Cook and Ludwig, you know, these scholars have a hard time demonstrating statistical significance because there are so many causes to crime and safety. But there, here are some things that are even suggested by the Supreme Court's decision that seemed to me should be very useful in resolving a lot of these questions. Heller gave us a common use standard. So if we're going to make a decision about what kinds of firearms are in common use, let's look at what the American people actually do, run the numbers. The, the District of Columbia at one point immediately post-Heller was actually considering a ban on uh, the self-loading pistols, semi-automatic pistols, and only allowing uh, the possession of revolvers. Well, Semi-automatic firearms have been around for 100 years. Uh, most handguns manufactured today by large margins are semi-automatic. Formal defensive training in handgun use focuses strongly on semi-automatic pistols. And there's just tons of them, tens and tens of millions in private hands. And it's pretty clear that you wouldn't have to do a sophisticated analysis to conclude that if a handgun ban, if you can't ban a category of arms in common use for self-defense, you can't ban semi-automatic pistols flatly. And that's a lot easier than trying to do a multivariate statistical analysis about safety. Here's another one. What is ordinary police practice and equipment? Uh, if, we, if there's a belief that there are a lot of decision makers out there that aren't sympathetic to the idea of uh, private individuals defending themselves with firearms in confrontations, let's look at the practices of people that pretty much everybody agrees should be able to defend themselves effectively with firearms in confrontations. And so you confront something like the claim, you know, California in some areas uh, allows open carry rights but only if the gun is unloaded uh, and you have the ammunition somewhere else on your person. Does that substantially burden or destroy the right to use the gun for self-defense in a sudden confrontation? Ask the police if they'd submit to that for a day, and the, the claim can be rejected. Yeah, it clearly does substantially burden it. And then we can pass to some somewhat more sophisticated uh, questions where scholarly help would be extremely valuable, but that look like they're a little more promising than some of the, the traditional uh, subjects. How do, given that there's a right to use one's firearms for self-defense, how do different restrictions on that right affect the inclination or ability of people uh, to do it. If we're going to have a regime of fees and formal training requirements, how much does that discourage people who would otherwise purchase a pistol for self-defense in the home? Does the deterrent effect of these regulations fall disproportionately on women or people in high crime neighborhoods who we might think would es could especially use the the added defensive capability of a firearm. Uh, how about storage requirements? Run some tests and see how, whether it interferes with the ability to use guns in self-defense. So that's a whole area of empirical research. It seems directly relevant to the scope of the Second Amendment. And like I said, I have a, I, my you know, raw suspicion is that statistically significant results would be a lot easier to come by. So, so re just to follow up, thank you. So research on, on burdens, 
the burdens that um, that existing or newly proposed gun laws might impose is important. But we also need to balance research on burdens with research on benefits. So even if even if we do observe some burden, we're going to need to think about also what's the potential concomitant benefit, and then we're back in standards of review territory. Ultimately, uh, to to give sort of a final response um, to the, the first question with regard to where does the money come from, what I would argue is judge the research, don't judge the funding. That, that can be difficult. That, that requires expertise, expertise that judges sometimes don't have, but that's really what we need to do. Can I say, I, I think the larger point here is how uh, complex and, and, and variable all of this is, and, and you made that point before. Even this business about guns in common use um, it immediately made me think of the dynamic in the Fourth Amendment where we talk about reasonable expectations of privacy. And you know what? That's a moving target. The more the government intrudes, the more we're told that it's reasonable for us not to have an expectation of privacy. And so the more in some states where they allow certain kinds of guns, the more a jurisdiction like the District of Columbia will be uh, 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 dragged along because now it's said to be in common use. And you're right about what was initially being thought of on the council, but we quickly uh, uh, moved away from that in terms of the semi-automatic weapons, but what if in more common use then becomes these um, uh, automatic weapons, you know, with like 30 rounds, 100,000 rounds, I don't know, uh, what then would be in common use? And that goes back to your point, which I think is quite right. That's why we have to have a, a greater clarity about standard of review, because in a situation where the evidence is somewhat... Um, indeterminate in terms of who wins or what variables are most prominent, maybe there should be deference then to the legislature uh, based on using its best judgment and examining all the data and the uh, arguments that it came out one way. And that ought to be, you know, the position of judges. Judges shouldn't be litigating, I mean, uh, prescribing this for legislatures. If, if it's a traditional way of defining the scope of the right, and it is, um, and is way more tractable, again, than a lot of uh, social science disputes in this area, then it's, it's what you might call a constitutional fact. And yeah, courts need to pay attention to it, and appellate courts need to engage in meaningful de novo review of those issues. That's just, you know, that, that's enforcing the right. The only other thing I would say, I don't disagree, obviously, with Professor Vernick's point, but the thing that has to be kept in mind when talking about burdens is, we do at some point come back to Justice Scalia's observation. This is the point of the observation. Guns are dangerous, yet the Second Amendment says that Americans have the right to keep and bear them. Well, let me uh, – we have a few minutes for questions, so uh, uh, let's, uh, uh, let's uh, take some questions. Uh, a few ground rules. One, uh, uh, let's make them questions. Uh, two, uh, uh, if there are press – uh, uh, here who want to ask a question, we, there's a uh, somewhat of a deferential posture towards that, so you should uh, let me know. Uh, uh, three, uh, identify yourself. Uh, and four, uh, there are microphones around the room, and so wait for the microphone before you start to speak. Uh, so are there press in the room? Any questions? Okay, uh, let's start with, with you. Um. Uh, wait for the microphone. Yeah. And can you identify yourself as well? My name is Carl Sandstrom. I'm an attorney in D.C. Oh, and very concerned about what the D.C. law. I was wondering, could a municipality pass a law saying that you could not carry a weapon onto someone else's private property without their express permission, or in the alternative, create a registry where people could list their property where their guns could not be carried? Well, currently, they certainly can because the two Supreme Court decisions that we've had have restricted the right to the home. So the, that real question is whether there is a right to carry a firearm outside of the home, and, and that we just don't know yet. Um, and generally, uh, your private property rights uh, take precedence over 
uh, another individual's constitutional rights. Basically, remember the Constitution has a state action requirement. The Constitution is, uh, with the exception of the 13th Amendment, which limits uh, uh, involuntary servitude or slavery, the Constitution only limits what the state does or what the government does or what government actors do. It does not limit what private actors do. And so generally, if you want to kick someone off your property because uh, you don't like their religious beliefs or you don't like their possession of a firearm, uh, you're generally entitled to do that. Do you have an ordinance to require express permission? I believe so, yeah. I'm not sure. It's, there's certainly less burdensome and more straightforward ways of accomplishing that, and that's just what's done in you know, most of America, where, there's, uh, where there are carry rights. People post their property. Businesses can do it. There's the you know gun with a with a Ghostbuster sign through it, um, and with a few limited exceptions in some jurisdictions, uh, that's effective for the reasons that Professor Winkler said. There is a division between different states in that some actually make it a separate crime to go with a you know with a carried firearm onto posted property or a posted business, whereas others just treat it as a form of trespass. You know, and it can be criminal trespass if you don't leave, but it's usually a pretty minor offense. So some states uh, more strongly sanction it, but in virtually all of them, you know, if you're asked to leave and you don't, it's at least a trespass. Um, and you can make good arguments that simply having the sign up is already tantamount to a don't come on my property if you're carrying. Yeah, in fact, the real controversy is whether a state can, or a municipality can pass a law that uh, entitles you to carry your firearm onto someone else's private property. That's what we've seen with uh, uh, some states that are saying that you can carry a firearm uh, onto uh, your place of business, into the, the parking lot of your place of business, uh, right? Disneyland doesn't want, or Disney World does not want its, uh, uh, its people, co employees carrying guns in their parking lot even, and so uh, Florida is trying to protect the employees. Uh, and that, ra that raises the real constitutional issue because then it's uh, the state taking sides with the right to bear arms over individual property rights, which are also protected by the Constitution. Would you analogize that, uh, and if so, to the prune yard shopping center kinds of cases where we can keep people out in terms of, or potentially about whatever their free speech issues are? Yeah, and uh, so, no, of course the, the shopping mall case that you're referring to was a, a one-off case that has never been repeated in the Supreme Court, which said that you had a right to free speech in a privately held shopping mall. Um, uh, but those cases have been, uh, there's been a series of cases since then that have gone the other way pretty strongly. Uh, so, uh, but yeah, I think that they are but, uh, I mean, arguably out. Wh whichever analysis. way we come out, that's going to be that same yeah. path. Yeah, right. Right. And actually Oklahoma, uh, my home state, has a, a law like that, a parking lot law mm -hmm. that uh, survived court challenge and was upheld by the Tenth Circuit a couple years ago. Yeah. Uh, given a number of hands, I'm going to take two at a time, actually. So, uh, in the back, uh, yeah, um, yes, you, and uh, and you. My question is for uh, John Vernick. Uh, my preconceptions about automatic weapons leading to more murders were shattered when I visited Jerusalem on a Saturday night, and I saw all these teenagers. Uh, going out partying with automatic weapons on their back because I was told they're Monday to Friday soldiers and everybody was very calm about it and the weapons were all loaded. I guess the question I want to know is about your number of 30,000 deaths in this country every year. Can you estimate for us how many of those are caused by people with registered guns of any type who kill another person where it's not suicide? Let's take, take a second question just to... Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. My name is Dan Friedman. My question is, you, uh, Professor Winkler, you talked about the categorization following the paragraph in Heller, uh, but we also talked about the state constitutional decisions before Heller, mm -hmm. and I was hoping, and obviously they, that court categorization didn't affect the, the standard of review prior to Heller. I was wondering if you could characterize for us the standards of review that were applied in those state constitutional uh, uh, cases prior to Heller. Okay. Ah, so this this requires me to remember the first question. This is, um, <laughs> so so um, fully automatic weapons, that is to say, machine guns, have been heavily regulated in the United, the United States since the 1930s. So since the sort of Al Capone kind of kind of era, there have been um, registration requirements. You have to pay a transfer tax. So it turns out that although the occasional um, 
high-profile incident that involves a fully automatic weapon um, gets a lot of press, fully automatic weapons are a very, very, very tiny part of the 30,000 gun deaths. Th of those 30,000 deaths, about roughly 12,000 are, are homicide. Now, the other part of your question, do we know how many of those 12,000 homicide um, homicide deaths with guns involved registered firearms? The answer is we really don't. And the reason we don't is we have terrible, terrible data collection systems in the United States for, for guns. If, if a person dies on a public road in a, in a car, we have an incredible amount of data are collected. People descend on the scene, and in one place, information about the car, the roadway, the drivers, the passengers are all collected. Unfortunately, for gunfire, we don't have a comparable fatal gunfire reporting system. Such a system is starting to be built in a handful of states with funding from the CDC. I think we're up to 17 states or so. But, um, but until we have more states and until the data in that system is more complete, we won't be able to answer questions like yours. That's why I asked for your estimate. My estimate. Well, because because I'm a researcher at a school of public health, we, we decline to provide estimates where where we just don't don't have the basis for an estimate. Um, with regards to the state uh, constitutional law cases, yeah, actually that was uh, what inspired me to write that article in 2007 was uh, going into the state cases. And and the surprising thing I found was not only was the right to bear arms. Uh, well established in state constitutional jurisprudence. Like I say, 42 out of the 50 states have clear individual right to bear arms provisions and hundreds of cases decided under them. But despite the wide variety of states, from southern states where you'd expect uh, to be the courts to be quite hostile to gun control to uh, 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 urban places where you'd expect, uh, you know, states that have mostly urban communities where you'd expect uh, them to be uh, quite friendly to gun control, every state uh, applies the same standard of review. Uh, and it's called the reasonable regulation standard. Uh, and uh, it is uh, basically a, a rule that says that uh, so long as you don't completely disarm the civilians, uh, uh, gun control uh, will be upheld uh, as long as it's not arbitrary or capricious. And uh, the kinds of arbitrary laws that were invalidated were uh, laws where they said, uh, the place, the, the municipality said, well, you can't, um, uh, you restricted the carry of a firearm, and it was interpreted to mean you couldn't even take your firearm home from the gun store that you bought it at. And if you moved your house, you were not allowed to bring the gun with you. So, like, you had to take your boxes, and the new people would come into the old house, and you have to leave your guns there for them because the guns weren't allowed to leave the house. You know, kind of an, a really irrational kind of arbitrary law. So, despite all of that, uh, for uh, over 150 years, you have this reasonable regulation test, which is uh, applied, I think, almost without exception. Uh, I've engaged in a debate with one of uh, uh, Mike's uh, co-authors, and uh, where he thinks there's a couple cases that go the other way. Uh, but well, there there are, and <laughs> especially especially early, and they're pretty striking. The so the first the uh, one of the big things I'll say is this: if you look at the the antebellum United States courts. Uh, there's a lot of categoricalism. It's an interesting experience for, you know, an uh, early 21st century American who is used to reading lower federal court opinions since the New Deal about the right to arms that, you know, there are actually, if you go back in history, there were times where there were a lot of judges who thought this was an important right and would write about it in some of the same you know, genuinely sympathetic and fulsome terms that we sort of routinely expect in cases about the First Amendment today. Uh, the first American right to arms case was a Kentucky case from 1922, um, 1822, and that state's highest court held that neither open carry nor concealed carry could be prohibited. The right was to be enjoyed in its fullest extent, and it was up to the individual to decide how to carry his personal arms. Uh, another 1840 Tennessee case uh, took a military view of the right to bear arms, but then went on to say that the right to keep arms that were within the scope of uh, the Tennessee right to arms and the Second Amendment was an unqualified right. Uh, and then the case most prominently and emphatically <coughs> cited in D.C. v. Heller by the majority is Nunn versus State, an 1846 Georgia Supreme Court case that struck down a carry ban under the Second Amendment as a violation of the Second Amendment and, in the court's words, the, the Supreme Court's words, perfectly captured the way in which the clauses of the Second Amendment work together. 
And the court quotes at length, the right of the whole people, old and young, men, women, and boys, and not militia only, to keep and bear arms of every description, and not such merely as are used by the militia, shall not be infringed, curtailed, or broken in upon in the smallest degree. That is the most prominently cited case in Heller, and the post-New Deal cases that Professor Winkler's article is about are essentially ignored. They are not discussed by the court in McDonald or Heller, which to me is a pretty clear message to lower courts. We have a 19th century, you know, some might say a, a real, a non-officially disfavored constitutional right to arms in mind here. should note just in passing that all of the states that he mentioned in those cases in the 1800s uh, all of the courts in those states have since ruled on the constitutionality of gun control in the post-New Deal era, and they've all applied the reasonable regulation test, <laughs> meaning that those cases are no longer good law. I, I encourage you all to <laughs> I encourage you all to read uh, Professor Winkler's book and Professor O'Shea's scholarship to continue this debate. Uh, I'd like to take more questions, but unfortunately, we're, we're out of time. Uh, so I, I think some of the panelists might be uh, might linger. So. Uh, you can ask them uh, questions individually, but uh, please join me in thanking our panelists uh, for a lively exchange.